Gas, gas. Quick, boys, an ecstasy of thumbling. Fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. These are memorable lines written by the First World War poet Wilfred Owen about a gas attack here on the Western Front. Now, it's not certain that Wilfred Owen actually ever witnessed one for himself, but they still stand as a, a powerful contemporary response to chemical warfare. And despite the many revolutionary changes to warfare on land, sea and air, there was something about chemical warfare, something about gas that inspired a particular terror and has continued to do so down through the ages. People tend to think it was the Germans that really started chemical warfare in, in World War I. But in fact, the first use of chemicals on the battlefield was the French. They threw hand grenades containing tear gas in August 1914, but they had a pretty negligible effect. Later in the war, in October 1914, the Germans experimented by firing canisters containing an irritant that gave anyone who came into contact with it violent sneezing fits. And the Germans went one step further and on the 31st of January in 1915, way over on the Eastern Front, they fired shells full of tear gas, but those failed to operate correctly because of the sub-zero uh, temperatures out there fighting the Russians. Then in the late afternoon of the 22nd of April 1915, men from a specially trained German army unit released more than 160 tonnes of chlorine gas in the Ypres salient. The big cloud of gas drifted towards the uh, French held lines. They were troops from France's North African Empire, Algerians and Moroccans, and they were told to prepare for an attack. It looked like this was a smokescreen uh, and there'd be Germans advancing under cover of it. But in fact, uh, it was not a conventional attack, it was a chemical weapons attack. Now, by pure coincidence, my great grandfather was actually a witness of that attack. He was stationed a little bit further on the line. He wrote about it in his memoir. He says that he noticed a whitish blue mist, the northeast of us, over French lines. It was the sort of mist one expects to see over water meadows on a frosty night. We were rather puzzled by it. We soon noticed a peculiar smell which made our noses and throats tingle. And it was some time before we realised that this was the much talked of gas. As my great grandfather then witnessed, the French troops, the colonial troops, flooded back in total disarray, panicked by this new weapon system. Around five or six thousand of them were killed or wounded in the first few minutes of that gas attack, opening up a four mile gap in the Allied line. Bizarrely, it also taken the Germans by surprise. They weren't expecting to, uh, uh, for it to be that successful. And as a result, they weren't really ready to exploit that breakthrough. In the event, after a few days of forward and back fighting, both sides were approximately in the same positions where they'd begun before the gas attack. But that can't disguise the fact that the gas attack was the first successful use of chemical weapons in military history. And as far as that goes, it was a turning point. The Allies had been caught out. Despite lots of intelligence reports uh, before the use of gas, they'd been completely surprised and they were determined to retaliate at the first opportunity. And that opportunity came here at the Battle of Luce in September 1915. They released poison gas. It didn't go so well. The wind changed and blew much of the gas back into the faces of the British troops that had released it. So they ended up poisoning more Brits than Germans that day. The first British use of gas was not a success, but it was laying down a marker. It was a statement, a statement of intent that the British would continue to explore and try and refine lethal poison gas as the war went on. Germany might have led the way when it came to chemical warfare, but as so often in World War I, one advance prompted countermeasures as the other side scrambled to catch up and innovated very effectively. Now, in early 1915, the Allies were 
uh, issued with rags, handkerchiefs, socks soaked in bicarbonate of soda, or even urine. They were told to pee on their own handkerchiefs because the ammonia in that urine would counteract the effect of chlorine. But quite rapidly, respirators were introduced and they improved dramatically during the course of the war. You can see I've come to this fantastic treasure trove of archaeological finds on the Western Front here, and there's quite a lot of evidence for uh, respirators here uh, and gas masks, which got really quite effective. And that meant that after May 1915, relatively few people actually died from gas attacks. The Imperial War Museum think that only 6,000 British and Imperial troops died from poison gas during World War I. Now that sounds a lot of people, but it's very small compared to the overall number of, of deaths in the war. In fact, it's only about a third of the number of people killed in one day of fighting on the Battle of the Somme. But it wasn't just the fact that gas killed and incapacitated people, it was the psychological effect of gas. And you can tell from Wilfred Owen's poem and from other testaments of survivors that gas operated a psychological and morale effect long after the physical effects had passed away. As the war went on, the use of poison gas became commonplace. By the war's end, the Germans had used nearly 70,000 tonnes of gas and the British and French between them about 60,000 tonnes. The precedent had been firmly set uh, and it's been something that has gone on right up to the present day. Most recently, the use of sarin gas in Syria. Of all the toxic legacies of the First World War, perhaps one of the worst has been the use of chemicals against our fellow men.